Hello and welcome to Expand Into Love, the video summit where we are talking about love and all of its essences. I'm your host, Melissa Sarazen, and I've gathered experts from all over the world to come and to share with us how we can connect to our heart on a daily basis, how to increase our intuition to help us live in love, and to activate our inner resources so that expansion into love becomes our normal, everyday being. And today I'm really excited to present to you Gabriel Gonzalez. And he is born in Venezuela. He's a coach, an author, and founder of Heart and Mind Consulting, where he helps people create a life they love. And this includes having deeper, more loving relationships, experiencing greater health and well-being while building a thriving heart-centered business that allows you to fully express yourself and have ample income to do what you love. So welcome, Gabriel. I'm so excited that you've decided to join us today. And let's just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be doing the work that you're doing. Mm, sure, Melissa. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to be part of your interview series. Um, I always love sharing my story, but more importantly, you know, that it doesn't stay as a story, that as, as you're listening to it, you're also looking at how that touches your story and what that awakens in you. Um, you know, one of the things I discovered about the journey of the path of the heart, that it's really it's, it's in our stories, how you really reach other people's hearts. Um, and so, yeah, so how did, I, how did I become, how did I go from being an actor, pursuing a career in the entertainment industry eight years ago, um, to now being a professional transformational coach that specializes in this area of heart center intelligence or heart intelligence? Well, I came here to South Africa eight years ago to work on a film project. And I was very excited. I had never been to South Africa before, you know, all, all I heard about South Africa was what, you know, what everybody was exposed to during the early nineties about what happened after apartheid and so forth. Mm -hmm. So when I arrived here, I just fell in love with this place, the, the beaches, the people, you know, a sense of freedom. And not only that, I was making lots of money working as a producer. And so life was very good. And I would say I was probably at the height of a highly successful career in the entertainment industry. And then what happened was in a period of two weeks, my life took a completely unexpected turn when first I was mugged, okay? Um, and I was robbed from my, of my passport, my ID, you know, like everything pretty much that I, that, that I own in terms of like, you know, things that I can identify with. And I remember thinking to myself, the moment that happened, once my IDs were gone, like, oh my God, this is so strange. I'm in a country <laughs> that I've never been to before. And suddenly it's like, I don't, I can't even prove to other people who I am anymore. Um, and then a few days after that, I was fired from the production job. Um, the job that brought me here that was paying me so well, suddenly the guy who hired me um, decided to not make the project anymore. And suddenly I'm in a country where I don't know anybody. Um, the people that I came to work with, they all, they all left. I can't leave because I don't have a passport. I have to now go through the whole process of, you know, um, applying for a new passport and all that kind of stuff and waiting for credit cards to arrive. And then while I'm going through this process of like, oh my God, what happened? I get the news that my mother in Venezuela had just passed away. She had been diagnosed with lung cancer a month before. Um, and so I was in such a um, state of grief and, and despair. And, and really, all I can say is that at that moment is my life. Um, was completely turned upside down. What I thought was going to be the adventure of a lifetime traveling and, you know, and having this wonderful experience and taking my career to the next level ended up being, you know, at what felt at that moment as the worst experience of my life. Like, like almost my, my biggest fears all happening pretty much all at the same time mm. within a matter of days, basically. And 
I call that the cracking open of my heart. I call that the moment when um, the light began to get in because what I realized at that moment was that once I got, you know, my ID and my password and everything, I just kind of had this, this, this knowing I'm not going to go back to Los Angeles. I'm not going back. I couldn't tell you why, but I just kind of got the sense of like, I'm not going back. I mean, first I can't leave right now, even if I wanted to, I was very heartbroken. I couldn't even attend my mom's funeral because of not having a passport. Um, and so during that time, I would, I remember I walked into a, uh, you know, one of those, um, esoteric bookstores because mm. being in a place in a country where I didn't know anybody and, uh, the state, the emotional state I was in, um, I just thought, you know, let me just get in reading just to see, you know, what the cards have to say, what the angels have to say. Mm. And so this woman invited me to this, this woman that I met at this, at this, uh, bookshop invited me to go out into a um, you know, beautiful garden and we sat down and I just basically poured my heart out. She was really the first person that could, that I could really share everything that I had been, you know, holding in the middle of so much pain. And she looked at me with a lot of compassion. She listened to me. And once I, I was done talking and obviously crying, she looked at me with the most like loving, compassionate smile. And she just said, Gabriel, um, your heart has been speaking to you for a long time and you have not been listening. So all these things had to happen so that enough light could get inside your heart for you to be list for you to start listening to the higher calling of your soul. And I was like, you know, what do you mean? What does that mean? And she just simply said, it's time for you to start listening to your heart. And I was like, but how do you do that? She just said, listen to your heart. She said to me these words, I will never forget this. She said, listen, listen to, your word, to your heart as if your life depended on it. Yeah. Because it does. And then she said, you're going to be okay. You're going to do great things. And then she kissed me, blessed me, and then she left. And I was just like, I, just, I was just left like, what just happened? What did this woman just say to me? You know? And so I started doing exactly what she said. You know, I had no idea what the hell it meant by listening to your heart. Now I know many years later that it really means to listen to my feelings. But at that time, I began where I was at, which I really started actually feeling my heart and listening to my heartbeat. That's always a really good place to start these days. For anybody that's listening to you, if you, you know, that you're listening to my story, if you feel disconnected to your heart, the first step is actually listen to your own heartbeat. That's always a good space. You know, I, I teach and believe that the path to the heart is through the body. And so listening to your actual physical sensations of the heartbeat in the body is always a good way to start going inward. And so that's what I did. I started listening to my heart. And then I noticed that whenever I thought about going back to Los Angeles, the energy, first of all, the heart was low down. And the energy in, in here would feel like close. Mm. When I thought about staying here, you know, my heart would like beat up a little faster, but not like with fear. It's some kind of a, like a thrill, excitement. Mm. And then it would open up. And I was like, oh my God, I've never become aware that, you know, that my heart was talking to me this way in the past. And so I made a decision. I'm going to stay in South Africa. Um, I'm going to volunteer for an NGO for three years because the truth is, um, you know, the, the wonderful thing about death um, is that it put me in touch with life. Mm. And so I realized I have really been living um, the first 40 years of my life. I had just turned 40 the month before all of this happened. Um, I've been living all about me. I had been in very vain, worried about how I look and my own success and, you know, really, like, really focus on me, 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 me. And I just said, maybe it's time for me to start, you know, helping other people. There's got to be something else, you know, to life. There's got to be something more. So I opened up. And so I got this job for an NGO um, for three years. And then at the same time, I began a program, a long distance program in uh, consciousness of ministry in new thought, ancient wisdom. 
So I began to, you know, study long term um, diff what what all the different traditions had to say about the heart, and then I started studying, you know, what the Heart Math Institute started, um, where I'd been researching around the heart. And so by the time I ended up my three year tenure or or volunteer volunteership, is that I can you say that? Sure. I guess you can. I, we just made up that word. Um, once I did that, um, I just knew that um, I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to be a transformational coach, and I wanted to, and I wanted to help people, especially people who were going through what I went through. Hmm. You know, so if you're listening to this and this, you feel like your life is falling apart, you're feeling a, you know what we call this divine discontent or a sense that. Um, it's time to close the door to a chapter of your life, like you're bored, you're tired, you know there's something new wanting to emerge, but you know what that is. Um, you know, those are the kind of people I love to I'd love to work with. Because again, that is that is where I had my uh, my mas my master degree program in my PhD. You know, how to how to move to another country, have your fall your life completely fall apart. And then how to start listening to your intuitive guidance that's available through your heart to then begin to navigate that space where you don't know where money's going to come from, uh, where you new friend, how are you going to make new friends, where you can live, how are things going to work out. And here we are, eight years later. It's been a journey of a lifetime. I love my life. I feel happier than I ever have before. I feel like I'm living on purpose. And I just love helping people. Um, access that internal wisdom of the heart so that they can start then creating that life that you had been secretly desiring because you know when i look back at my life i had secretly been longing or desiring to live the way i'm living right now and to do what i'm doing right now but the truth is i kind of bought into somebody else's idea of what success is and then i sort of you know I, I i became another rat in this rat race the entertainment rat race that as Lily Tomlin likes to say, you know, even after you win the rat race, the problem with it is that you're still a rat. So I was, <laughs> you know, you're still, you're still, I was still a rat, you know, that's why I could never be satisfied no matter what my achievements were. You know, so that one of the things that, that I think is one of the, one of the great benefits of beginning to really live from a place of, of wholeness that, that you can access through your heart is this sense that um, you are whole, perfect, and complete right there, right here, right now, this moment, that there's no need to add anything to it to make it better or more exciting, but that everything is unfolding, you know, in, in, in a perfect harmony. You know, you're, one, of the things a lot of, one of the things that took me a long time to realize is that the planet has its own heartbeat that, you know, scientists call Schumann's resonance. And so when we slow down to the rhythm of the planet, what really happens is there is a emerging or a um, entrainment between your, call it your vibration, but it really is your energetic uh, heartbeat and then the beat of the planet, the heartbeat of the planet, which by the way, normally has a tendency to also be entrained with the central, um, the central heartbeat of the universe. You know, you can call that the heart of God, the central sun. I mean, there are so many different metaphors or names that we use for this. And so it is, it is by aligning with the heartbeat of the planet or my heartbeat and then my heartbeat of the planet that I then begin to get a sense of being in harmony with life. You know, that's one of the great things that begins to happen once you start really living in alignment with, yeah, with greater heart harmony with the whole that you begin to enter into the state that the heart math institute likes to stay likes to call coherence which is another word for togetherness which is again a sense of flow that you're flowing with the rhythm of life it doesn't mean that life is going to be like perfect and you're never going to experience pain but it means you're going you move with the pain i move with the loss and then I move, you know, if, like, like children, like little children. If you watch little children, they move from one emotion to the next. Our pets, so in the moment, they move from one emotion to the next. So it's, it's, a, it's the ability to be basically with life as opposed to fighting it, trying to analyze it, or trying to um, 
uh, you know, like Karen, like Byron Katie likes to say, you know, every time you try to argue with life, you lose. Yes. So it's that kind of thing, <laughs> that kind of sense of stopping arguing with what is and beginning to align with what is and the energy of the, this moment of isness to then create the life that you want. Mm. I'm going to stop there because I'm realizing I'm just talking here, here, so I haven't even let you ask a question. That's a problem with me is that, you know, I love talking. That's okay. That's okay. I, I love listening to your story. You know, this is the second time that, that I've heard you tell it. And, and yet it's, it's so rich. And I realize that there's a lot of similarity to your story and my story. And I've never heard it explained in that way. This is why I love doing these interviews because I always get a new perspective. Um, when I hit my rock bottom, I was in Australia living on an organic farm. And it was through the tutelage of the man that I was, that we were uh, living with and who was teaching us about his farm and the way that everything was interconnected. And I realized as you are talking, I remember that I used to go up into the garden when it was time to um, harvest what we had planted, that I would first sit in the garden and I would just take a few moments to just connect to everything. And I started to talk to the plants. and because I didn't know uh, what, I had never planted anything before, I'd never grown anything before. And so I didn't know when it was ready. So I thought, well, I'll just connect and ask the plant when it was ready. And when you said that the heartbeat of the earth, I was like, oh, that's what I did. It kind of intuitively fell into it because I was all of a sudden able to just kind of stand back from my life, you know, and from the achievements that I thought that I was maybe and the the things that I thought I was supposed to do and how I was supposed to do them, all of them got turned upside down on their head. And um, we were actually, uh, and it was on an island, we were, you know, disconnected from the world when 9-11 happened. And I just remember sitting there watching going, wow, we are so far removed from that. And I knew that I was safe. And something about that experience allowed me to, to know that life was supporting me, like you just said. Sometimes it's hard when we keep having these things thrown at us. It's hard to understand that these things that are being thrown at us are actually there to support us. They're actually there to help us open our hearts and to live the life, like you, know, like you said, to discover what those secrets are and to start living the life that you always dreamed of. And I love how you bring it back to the the physicalness of your body. You know, I never thought to listen to my heartbeat. That was, and, and that just seems so simple. And yet, if I want to connect to myself, and I have to connect to the rhythm of what is inside. And that just seems like the perfect place to start. I, and I love the simplicity of that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, tell me more about <laughs> living the path of the heart um, and how, you know, how many different expressions of love how, have you discovered in your life? There's a question. <laughs> expressions of love. <laughs> Goodness. Um, yeah, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a general question. Oh. Um, um, well, I always think of romantic love first whenever the word love comes ah. up. And then it's like, oh, well, do I want to go there? Because I have to protect my heart because I'm going to get hurt. Okay. Okay. No good. You know, the, um, I think that without a doubt, that's been one of the, um, one of the, what has been one of the big paradigm shifts for me. You know, as a good Latin American, um, you know, uh, descendant. I grew up in Venezuela watching telenovelas, you know, our soapies, you know, which are basically, you know, they are six month long uh, romantic uh, stories that basically, you know, perpetuate this idea of the perfect love of the, you know, of the, uh, the princes and, and, you know, the savior that is going to come and, and rescue you. And I can't remember, you know, how many in my relationship, I, I, I look for that. And, you know, I, I, I went, yeah, I long and look for that and was just like use relationships after relationship to try to get that and try to get that, try to get that. And, and 
I couldn't understand where I was going wrong. And, you know, these days, uh, I teach a, 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 a workshop, an online, an online program, and a live workshop called The Path to Soulmate Love. Mm. Okay. And one of the things I teach there, something I did not know, and is that our idea of romantic love actually, um, you know, emerged short from, you know, from this courtly love that evolved in medieval. Europe, but what a lot of people don't know is that you know, that this thing that we call love was never really the way the way the, the, the story was not the story that we tell these days or that we have been telling for the past four hundred years. You know the truth when you look back at the the Greeks and the Romans, you know they did not um, they did not look at love the way that we looked at it. Yeah. In fact, they emphasized brotherly love. You know, brothers in arms, way above, uh, you know, the, the romantic love between men and women. And sure, you know, people fell in love, but it wasn't idealized. They idealized more the love between two brothers, you know, especially brothers in arms. And don't forget, there were an ancient that was that, that was pretty much always at war, mm -hmm. you know. And so, and so, what a lot of people don't know, and I certainly didn't know, is that, you know, that our notion of love comes from. The French troubadours, who during the Renaissance actually then began to bring the poetry in Sufism, mm -hmm. the poetry of Sufism. I mean, the stuff that Rumi, the stuff that Rumi was writing, they began to basically to bring that into this thing called courtly love. Okay, now the poetry of Sufism spoke about the beloved and merging with divine, you know, merging with a divine being that we call the beloved. Mm -hmm. And that by, and that by surrendering ourselves or giving ourselves fully to the beloved, which is the divine presence within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. We will we'll attain like this perfect union. But what the troubadours then said they did, they basically, they took that notion and they basically in the songs, they weaved it in. And then instead of being, instead of making the divine or the beloved, the recipient of that love, they made it a, you know, a, an, another human being. Mm -hmm. That by pursuing another person, we would attain like the most highest form of sublime and we would be saved. Okay. Now during the court love period, what would happen was that a knight would pursue a you know a princess or a woman and she was not available okay she wasn't available um, because either she had a vote, vote of chastity or she was already married and so it is by giving himself completely to her then he would then become tame his sexual passion and along the way he would become a gentle man that's that's where the the word gentleman comes from it was by devoting myself to to somebody who was the object of my affection and removing my sexual passion that i would grow spiritually and so so that's how the notion of romantic love evolved and so you know the problem that we that and this is kind of where it now comes together to the heart the problem with that kind of notion of love is that it is completely uh, warped, okay? Because what happens is we now began to basically attribute to another person the, the you know, like our happiness, basically, you know? You know, instead of making God our source of, you know, that only place where we can really feel unconditionally loved, you know, instead of giving the divine, we attributed this divine quality to another human being who is imperfect like you are, who can be needy like you are, you know, who, who farts, who has bad breath sometimes, you know, <laughs> one day loves you and who at the other day doesn't want to spend time with you because, you know, they... they they have to work or whatever right. changes in our mind moment to moment, you know? So the moment when we start, ex when we start expecting this one person to fulfill all these needs that only the divine can do, you know, it basically we creating this warped, uh, unrealistic version of love that I think it's the main reason why so many of us experience so much pain. Um, so you know, the important thing I think about this thing is to realize that no human being, can ever you know provide you the kind of love that only the divine you know can give you and the only way the only place that i believe and i know where i can access that level of unconditional love 
is from my heart. Mm. Not only that, the only place where I can then offer this love to my partner, to my pet, to my friend, to my business partner, is by first learning how to access it inside of me through my heart. That's the only place. It's almost like I'm saying literally to the divine, to God, to source, to spirit, you know, something like, you know, God, I'm just very imperfect and my human love is very conditional, okay? Because it's conditioned. Our human, human love is perfectly unconditional. I'm sorry, it's perfectly conditional. And anybody says, oh, I love you unconditionally, I think it's really <laughs> full of crap. Because I do believe that, you know, we love each other. I love you if you're my friend. If you do what I do, if you also love me back, if you show up in time for, you know, our dinners, you know, human love is, is conditional and it, and it's designed to be like that, by the way, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, you know? And so only when I begin to access that source of love through my heart inside of me, now I can, I can then be give it to other person. And the way that I do this, or you can do this is by literally saying to God, like, listen, God or spare or sores or heart or Jesus or, or whatever it is that you want to use as a, as a girl, as a being that represents that divine love. Okay. I'm going to invite you into my heart. Okay. Because I cannot love Melissa. If I, let's say my issue is with you. I cannot love Melissa unconditionally because I'm angry because I have this, because, you know, I see things differently, but you can come into your heart and you can teach me through your love to love her unconditionally you know i can surrender my little and perfect love to you so that you can fill my heart with unconditional love and then i can then give myself that unconditional love by loving myself and my anger and my emotions and you know what i'm feeling with regards to her right now just loving myself instead of judging myself as bad evil whatever and then i can extend her that love you know so what you're now seeing here is human love versus divine love mm. you know human which also you know you can include romantic love and, and all these different notions of love but then you have this other love that i believe it's only through the heart that i can access it nurture myself with it and then extend it out to another person mm -hmm. i love that that is that is well the truth <laughs> first um but I, I kind of, I want to address a kind of a contrast that seems to happen when people talk yeah. about self-love. You know, you had been saying that you were in Los Angeles and you were concerned with the way that you were looked. You were concerned with your career. You were consumed by your self-need to fulfill something. Mm -hmm. And then now you're saying that this divine love is in your heart. And when you connect to it, you can expand kind of into your life and it's yet yeah, still um shall i say self-centered so can you kind of just explain what the difference is and and what are the different results that you get in your life when you, you're you're focused in that way so. yeah it's you know it's great because i think this i think a lot anyone that's listening to this who who is um like the achiever type you know, you, you define your lot by your achievements um, will certainly relate to this. See, one of the things I think is important to look at is the energy, the vibration, or the place that I'm coming from when I'm wanting to achieve something. Okay, you can call it your intention, but I call this your, you know, the source, okay, what drives you. Now, I, I grew up in a home of seven brothers and sisters, okay? It was seven of us. And the truth is, you know, you know how I have like the black sheep of the family? I was the white sheep of the family. Like, okay. The white sheep of the family is like the little angel. He's very quiet. He doesn't make much noise, you know? But the truth is that I did that. And my, my behavior as a child was because I did not really feel seen. I didn't feel loved. You know, and so rather than trying to be like my brothers and sisters that screamed for love and cried for love and misbehave and, you know, I just thought maybe by pulling away, somebody, you know, would love me, would notice me. And the truth is that they wouldn't. They thought everything was okay. Mm -hmm. You know, so I grew up with the sense of there's something wrong with me. Why am I different from everybody else? 
you know i was also very aware at that time that um like i was different you know not only in terms of like you know uh, in terms of my sexual attraction but but also i was different in terms of um how i experienced life i had a level of um of connection with others that um, it's almost like I could see things that other people could not see. Mm. I could feel things that other people could not feel. And, and, and so I felt strange. As like, but I grew up with, with a sense of there's something wrong with me, something wrong with me. But at the same time, I remember thinking to myself, when I grow up, I'm going to show them who I am, how I am. I'm going to show them what I'm capable of. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like very silent. They didn't notice me. They didn't appreciate me. But I'm going to show them, I'm going to show mm -hmm. them, I'm going to show them. So th it was that feeling that drove me for a very long time. You know, but but what I've noticed is that what was driving me, the need to achieve, was ultimately because somehow deep down inside, I felt shame. I was ashamed of myself, that I did not fit, that I was different. There's something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. So I believe that the more I achieve, somehow I would be able to fit in. Somehow I would get loved, I would be admired, I would be whatever. But the truth is that even if people said to me, oh, you're great, you're amazing, oh, how wonderful, something inside of me was not satisfying. I had to achieve more and I had to achieve more. I had to date, a, you know, somebody better looking the next time around, achieve the next pro, you know, the next project, make more money. It's like I had to show them. So what was driving me was shame. And when, when, when shame is what drives me, you know, it can only generate more shame. Mm -hmm. It can only generate more shame. Mm -hmm. That's what was driving me. You know, so I got to a point where I just simply said, oh, my God, you know, I'm doing all these things to please other people. To make them happy, to make them loved. And even when they say they love me, I still don't feel their love because deep down inside what they reflect what I'm, re what, you know, what I'm creating is more shame. You know, so that's the thing about creating from shame or if you're creating from a place of guilt. Um, you know, when you're what I would call like lower level emotions. So I'm creating from that place. I can only create more of that. Mm. And so the connection with the heart um, allows me to move into a place where to the world might seem selfish. But I like to, sell that, I like to say that is selfish. Okay. Now, something a lot of people don't know when it comes to the heart is that the heart is the very first organ that develops in the human fetus. Not only that, one of the things the heart does is after it becomes a tiny little heart and then it creates a little bit of blood, who do you think it gives that blood to? It feeds itself. It nurtures itself first, you know? It doesn't go, oh, I have to give it to the brain because the brain needs it. Oh, I have to give it to the arms. It's like it, it, pump, it begins to pump itself and to make really, itself really strong. Okay. Why? It's going to basically act as the conductor, the main beat of the body. Don't forget, at that time, there's not even breathing. And not only that, the heartbeat is what's actually generating that pulsating electromagnetic wave that now scientists tell us looks like like a sphere, like a toroidal, toroidal field, okay? Mm -hmm. Donuts puts together, okay? And it is that that begins to basically draw the, 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 the perfect pattern out of which then this little baby begins to form, okay? So this thing is creating the, the electromagnetic energy. That's the source, okay? And so anyway, but the hard first thing that it does, it takes care of itself It knows that if it's to take care of the rest of the body and beat a hundred thousand times a day, a hundred thousand times a day, each day of that person's life, it has to nurture itself. So that metaphor is really beautiful for what it means to be self-ish. The heart is self-ish. It starts nurturing itself. So, you know, so the access to the heart is about learning to, for you to be or learning, I speak about me, for me to learn 
what are my deepest desires? What is it that I need to be happy? What kind of people, what kind of a place excites me, motivates me, inspires me? What are the kind of people, the places where I feel inspired, I, alive? And then begin to make choices, you know, but based on what inspires me, what feels good deep down inside. And sure, somebody else might look at it as like, oh my God, Gabriel being so selfish. And I go, yeah, I am being selfish. I'm living where, where I feel excited. I'm, I'm making friends with people that I love and I'm making decisions on my well-being, what makes me happy, what brings me joy. Because only when I'm happy, and I'm feeling joy, then what I create from that space will be amazing. Even if it ends up not working out, it will be amazing. And it will, because it's, it's being generated from a place of love, I wanted to create, wanted to contribute, wanted to feel good, it will have a tendency to, you know, to attract and draw more of that to itself. So I think it boils down ultimately at, you know, where do I want to be creating from? Do I want to be creating from a place of shame where I'm not good enough and pleasing other people? Or do I want to be creating from a place, what I would call, you know, from the heart or a selfish place, which is I'm going to make my, I'm going to make it my objective to feel good, to nurture myself. Because when I'm taking care of myself, I can then take care of other people. When I'm feeling good about myself, then I can help other people feel good. You know, when I'm giving to myself, then I can give, like Reverend Michael Beck would like to say, from the overflow. You know, instead of trying to do what I was doing before, which is, you know, when when I when I when I acted or tried to achieve from a place of shame is because I don't feel like I'm good enough. So I'm trying, I'm trying to do something so that you then give me something which I appears to be lacking in me. And so therefore, the void will never be filled, you know. And oftentimes, I'm trying to get it from people that, that don't, don't even have to give me, you know, because they're all caught up in their own cycles of guilt and shame, you know. And so they're trying, they're trying to, you know, they'll say, yeah, it was great because they'll feel guilty if they don't say that, you know what I mean? And so it boils down to where do you want to be creating from? Where do I want to be creating from? Do I want to be creating from a place of joy and love? Or do I want to be creating from a place of shame? Mm -hmm. And the heart is the space where I can access that joy. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I love the way that you explained it. And that metaphor really um, clears it up. I mean, if, if my heart is taking care of itself and I don't take care of my heart, then yeah, there's never going to be an overflow and there's going to be a lack that will never be filled. And I really hope that everybody hears that because that is really how you know. You know, if you do something in order with a certain expectation and that expectation doesn't get fulfilled, then that is your clue that you are not being selfish enough yeah and that's a very easy way for all of us to to determine that and to really focus on what what you said just creating more love for yourself and you attract other people who are doing the same thing so they have overflow if you have overflow then the people around you have overflow and you know just imagine for a moment what that feels like to be in a room full of people that all have overflowing love and energy to give and you're giving and receiving at the same time i mean that's connection and, and that's what we're all here for to experience yeah. that connection yeah exactly you know and 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 bringing it back to what we were speaking about earlier about these romantic relationships it's exactly that it's it's about learning you know it's like there is an old paradigm to relationship that is dying out and it's one of the reasons why so many relationships are coming to an end for a lot of people it's like a lot of these you know these these relationship patterns are based on an old paradigm which basically says i need somebody else to complete me to validate me you know and 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 so forth where the newer paradigm is saying i'm already whole perfect and complete i can access my own inner source of joy and i'm coming into the relationship to give that to share that but then also use the relationship as a vehicle for growing 
okay, which is very different, you know, as opposed to current paradigm, which is very much is, you know, it's almost like um, very vampiristic, you know, we just had Halloween, a lot of people would dress up at, as, um, as vampires, right. but it's like that, you know, it's like we're, we're yeah. I remember there is a, there is a Alejandro Jodorowsky, who's one of my favorite filmmakers, he's from Chile, he says that for the majority of people, love is when you try to give someone, when, when you try to give something, what do you call it? Trying to give something you don't have to somebody who doesn't want it. <laughs> you know? You know? And, and it's a very eloquent way of expressing that. You know? It's that we're trying to give from a place of guilt or shame um, where we don't know what it's like to really love ourselves. Okay? Um, and oftentimes we try to give this to the other person where that's not really what they want. Right. That's not really what they want or what will really deeply satisfy them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that expectation trap. You know, you're giving something thinking that it's going to benefit the other person and you, it, it doesn't. And then everybody just feels let down and it just uh, deflates the, the whole purpose yeah. for what, for the connection that you're longing for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, this has been a really, really rich conversation. I really, um, like I said, I've gotten a lot out of it. I've gotten, I'm going to go away now and listen to my heartbeat and see what it has to tell me because I really think that my own heart has shifted in ways in the last few months. And I'm going to start to listen to it differently and see what happens. So thank you. Yeah. That um, is definitely going to bring a different perspective uh, on, on that for me. Um, and as much as, uh, as well as everything else that we've talked about, I'm going to be selfish and see what happens <laughs> a little bit more. Anyway. Yeah, just remember the way, the way to the heart is through the body. Mm. So anybody out there that is, that is beginning to experience, you know, dis-ease, gaining weight, um, you know, or anything that relates to the body, oftentimes we're wondering, gee, why is this happening to me? Well, oftentimes that's your higher self you know, your soul, your spirit, your heart, because the heart is really the window of that connecting place that is speaking to you, that is basically saying, it's time for you to come back into your body so that you can connect with me, okay? And then so that I can then begin to guide you, you know, and start listening, you know, so bring the attention back to you. That's one of the things that, you know, that, that's many of the shifts a lot of people are experiencing. Okay, so it begin to see this thing that appears to be a discomfort or whatever as, you know, a disease mostly of the soul. This, this, a dis-ease in your soul, which means there's a disconnection with the soul. And it is through the heart that then you can then begin to access the, the intuitive guidance that is going to lead you to the right people, the right books, the right either foods or the right things that are going to allow you to start nurturing yourself. Mm. I love it. I love it. Definitely. And you also have a free gift that you're offering to help people get on to following the path of the heart. So tell us a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. So if you've been listening to this and it, it resonates with you and you want to learn more about what heart intelligence is and what are some of the practices, because, you know, we, we can speak about this, you know, for hours, but I think it really, the, the, the rubber meets the road once you start really putting a set of practices uh, things that you do on a regular basis that allow you to strengthen the connection with the heart, that allow you to really start listening to that. So if this resonates with you and you want to learn more about it, um, I offer a free course, online course, that it's an introduction to applied heart intelligence at my Academy for Applied Heart Intelligence. You get video lessons, audio lessons, where I take you through some of the basic concepts. Um, we talk about things like the heart wall, which is an energetic layer energetic wall of protection around the heart that keeps us from connecting either to ourselves or with other people um we, i talk about different different techniques that you can use to basically to um to break through that wall and access the inner wisdom and inner love of the heart and all of this is is completely free um that anybody for anybody that, that's interested in this when you go to the academy's website which is www.appliedheartintelligence.com mm -hmm. appliedheartintelligence.com wonderful i'll make sure that the link is included with this video so that anybody who is resonating and feels the calling can definitely find that there so right. 
you so much, Gabriel. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm very grateful that you've taken the time to share this with us and to offer such a generous gift to our listeners as well. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, my pleasure, absolutely. <laughs> so there we have it, another edition for the Expand Into Love video summit. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye for now.